Welcome to the MBI Health Report Podcast. We are proud that this is the first podcast that we are recording. This is Dr. John Neustadt, President and Co-Founder of Nutritional Biochemistry Incorporated, NBI. Over the last six years, MBI has been producing quality dietary supplements to help promote the health of you and your loved ones. And we've been producing also and disseminating weekly newsletters through the Internet to our email list with the latest health news. People have responded very favorably to this and to the reports of my presentations on various health topics to continuing medical education conferences to healthcare providers around the country on osteoporosis, medical biochemistry, neurological and psychiatric disorders, and have asked for more information to be provided to them so, again, they can learn how to make better choices to help themselves and their family. Admittedly, the healthcare system can be overwhelming for anybody. At some point in time, even doctors become patients. I myself will become a patient. I have been a patient, and the same with members of my family. To be able to navigate your way through the system, understand the most pertinent questions to ask, understand the options that are available so that you can make informed decisions about your own health care is really crucial. And we hope that in these podcasts we'll be providing information that will help you and your family learn how to be better advocates for yourselves and how to take your health in your own hands so that you and your family members and your other loved ones can live as vibrant and healthy a life as long as possible. The podcasts are going to be 30 minutes in length. We're open to suggestions about any future topics or if you have any suggestions, comments, criticisms, or questions, please email those to info at nbihealth.com. That's info at nbihealth.com. And we may address those in future podcasts. Today's topic is on osteoporosis. It is a deadly disorder. There are 39 million Americans with osteoporosis or pre-osteoporosis, also called osteopenia. And that number will increase in the coming decades as the baby boom generation retires. Osteoporosis is a disease of the bones, as most people probably already know. But what most people don't realize is that it's really not just about bone minerals. People get a bone mineral density scan, and that tells you how much mineral is in the bone. That's how osteoporosis is actually diagnosed by a bone density scan, also called a DEXA scan. A T-score of less than negative 2.5 is a diagnostic criteria for osteoporosis. And for pre-osteoporosis or osteopenia, it's a T-score of negative 1 to negative 2.5. But the bone is not just minerals. The bone is a tissue. And like all tissues, there are various elements within the bone. The minerals give bone its hardness. But the bone connective tissue, the collagen in the bone, actually provide the suppleness of in the bone or the ability of the bone to withstand the impact of a fall, disseminate that force over a wider area, deform slightly upon the impact, but not actually break. It provides the bone quality and provides strength to the bone. A bone density scan, however, just measures the mineral content. Most people who have come to me when I had my medical clinic in Montana, and they brought their bone density scan results, they were very concerned about the number on the test. And in fact, most people, when they go to their health care provider, the number on the test is talked about, and really the number on the test is what's treated, or an attempt to, is made to improve that number on the test. But what does that number really mean? Is the most dangerous aspect of osteoporosis a number on a test? No, of course not. A test number is what's called a surrogate marker. And there are many of them in medicine. A surrogate marker, uh, surrogate markers include cholesterol, for example. Well, a surrogate marker is only as valuable or clinically relevant as it is predictive for an actual event occurring. So, for example, 
cholesterol as a blood test is only as valuable as it is predictive or can predict a heart attack. A bone density scan, similarly, is only as valuable as it can predict a fracture. Fractures are the most dangerous aspect of this disorder, osteoporosis, not the number on a test. If you have osteoporosis and you fracture a hip, you have a 20% chance of dying within a year, and of those who survive, 20% can end up in chronic nursing home care with chronic debilitating pain. It is a devastating disease. So the number on the test, the bone density scan, again, is only as valuable as it is predictive for a fracture. Unfortunately, however, since the mid-1990s, it's been published uh, multiple times in the literature, the medical literature, that a bone density scan in and of itself only predicts 44% of women who will get a fracture and only 21% of men. So it is not that sensitive and it is not that specific. Now, should we just not use them? Well, no. I, I think it does provide some valuable information that can track possible disease progress. However, saying that we're going to treat a number on a test does not really reduce the risk of fractures as much as possible. In fact, Every ma major medical organization, including the World Health Organization and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, who have published position statements on the subject, conclude, and rightly so, that bone density is not that predictive for fractures. And in fact, fracture risk depends on factors largely other than bone density scan. In fact, when you look at the history of osteoporosis research and the definition of osteoporosis it is quite antiquated it dates back into the to the 1940s dr albrecht from the university of massachusetts in the 1940s was doing experiments on pigeons pigeons that had their ovaries removed and he noticed that the bones became fragile and that started the definition of osteoporosis as demineralized or fragile bones then as the technology developed with x-rays and bone density scans the diagnosis of the disease was finally codified officially as a t-score as mentioned before of less than negative 2.5 being osteoporosis and medications started to become developed that would improve that t-score and increase bone minerals the deposition of bone minerals however and unfortunately as is the story of many medications uh, side effects ensued and it became questionable as to their actual utility as well for reducing fractures see when you focus just on bone mineral density which is not that predictive of a fracture to begin with then the question also needs to be asked well if something's being used to improve my bone density uh, how much does it reduce fractures by? And perhaps this is the main take-home message of this podcast with respect to osteoporosis. There is only one fundamental question that you need to ask your healthcare provider, you need to ask yourself when you're reading information or learning information, and that is, does what I'm being recommended actually reduce fractures? By how much does whatever it is you're being recommended reduce fractures? That could be lifestyle modifications. That could be dietary modifications. That could include dietary supplements such as calcium and vitamin D that are often recommended for osteoporosis. It could be medications. So that's the question that needs to be asked. Not how much is this going to improve a number on a test, but how much will it actually reduce the risk for fractures? Since bones that are becoming weaker obviously are at a greater risk for fracture, let's look at that progression and the development of osteoporosis first before I discuss the medical treatment options, what the research says about uh, dietary supplements, lifestyle changes, exercise, diet, 
with respect to helping you understand in a more holistic and comprehensive way what the options possibly are so that you can discuss these with your health care provider and again make the best informed choices for your own health. Throughout childhood and into our 30s, 20s and 30s, bone is attaining its peak density, its peak mass, that is the amount of minerals that are in there because that's how these things are measured currently. After the 30s, though, we begin to lose bone density, that is minerals in bone typically begin to uh, leave the bone. And gradually over time, that can lead to a condition of osteoporosis. For women, for the 10 years after menopause, that's when the fastest rate of bone loss occurs. Estrogen helps build bone. It's also an anti-inflammatory. And th when with menopause, when the estrogen production declines, then the bone mineral density can be lost simultaneously. However, it's not just these natural processes of aging. And in fact, aging is the number one risk for developing osteoporosis as we get older. But there are other risk factors as well. Many diseases can cause osteoporosis. Diseases such as anorexia nervosa can cause osteoporosis. Diseases such as irritable bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease, can cause osteoporosis. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, often caused by history of smoking, can cause osteoporosis. Cushing's disease can cause osteoporosis. And the list goes on and on. One risk factor that's commonly overlooked and people aren't aware of is what's called the female athlete triad. Women who exercise vigorously, competitive athletes who run triads, who compete in marathons, they get a what's called the female athlete triad that, con that consists of disordered eating, amenorrhea where their periods stop, they lose so much body fat, their percent body fat goes down so much that they stop menstruating, and they get osteoporosis. It's something for parents to really look out for in their children, as well as, of course, the deadly eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, which predominantly affects women, although men can be affected, and predominantly affects girls in their teen years and young women in their 20s. Those can cause, also cause osteoporosis. Medications. Medications can cause osteoporosis. Prednisone, a very commonly prescribed anti-inflammatory. It's a corticosteroid goes under the name methylprednisone, prednisolone. That causes osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures. Very commonly recognized risk factor. In fact, oral prednisone taken for six months increases the risk of osteoporosis and a fracture by up to about 200%. And in fact, our own body's production of cortisol, because our body does produce cortisol, has been shown in one study at least it, we, even when it's in the normal range, cortisol is produced in, in response to stressful situations, people who are living under high-stress situations, or even if they have just the normal upper limit or high normal range of the cortisol in their body, that's been associated with an increased risk for decreasing bone density and osteoporosis. And that study was done in people who were quote-unquote healthy. There's also a commonly prescribed, commonly taken medication that most people are not aware that it causes osteoporosis, and that is the acid-blocking medications, the category called proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. They are Prilosec, Protonix, Zantac. A study was uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2006, the title of the study was Long-Term Proton Pump Inhibitor Therapy and Risk of Hip Fracture. In that study, what they found is that people taking these acid-blocking medications and the association, the risk was also found for uh, not just the proton pump inhibitors but the H2 blockers, which would be Zantac, that taking these medications for four years increased the risk of hip fracture by up to 200%. 
nearly 60%. That risk increased gradually over time. Increased the risk by 22% after one year, 41% after two years, 54% after three years, and nearly 60%, 59% after four years of therapy. Again, most people don't realize about these medications that they cause hip fractures or they can increase the risk for hip fractures. But also people don't realize, and I don't think most doctors realize, that the FDA never approved those medications for treatment of more than two weeks. And yet people are being prescribed them indefinitely. They're now available over the counter in drugstores. And people are popping them thinking that they're safe and they're not having any dangerous or deleterious effects. And the reality is now we know that there may be an up to 60% increase in hip fracture by taking those medications long term, which many, many people are currently doing. People have asked me before, what about coffee? I like coffee. I'm a coffee drinker. And so I looked into the subject. What about coffee? Does coffee cause osteoporosis? Well, interestingly enough, there was a large study done, uh, and it was published in uh, 2002, another study done in 1994, that looked at this question. It was 40,000 men and women in Norway uh, were followed for many years, and what they found was that the risk for osteoporosis was only increased if you consume nine or more cups of coffee a day combined meaning that also what I'm about to say next also has to be present, combined with low calcium intake. Therefore, to increase the risk of osteoporosis, you need to be consuming both nine cups or more a day of coffee and not consuming the minimum daily recommended intake of calcium. Now, if you are consuming, drinking nine cups of coffee a day, or if anybody is, I think there's something else going on that we need to look at. Why is somebody so exhausted? Why do they need that much caffeine or coffee? Uh, thyroid might be an issue, insomnia might be an issue, depression might be an issue. There's quite a list that needs to be looked at. But osteoporosis in general for most of these people is really not an issue. Uh, And ideally, if somebody is consuming that much coffee, then they should be worked up and evaluated for any other potential underlying causes and hopefully get help or assistance from a professional for that. A sedentary lifestyle, not exercising, also a risk factor for osteoporosis. It's important to get out there and move your body. Our bodies were built and meant to move. Being a couch potato, not healthy for your bones. Just get up and move around. The North American Menopause Society published its risk factors or what they consider the major risk factors for osteoporosis and those include advanced age, I mentioned that before, a low uh, bone mineral density or actually these are risk factors for fractures, Having a previous fracture, that's one of the the most predictive aspects of fractures, is if you've had a previous fracture, you're at an elevated risk for a future fracture. Uh, History of a hip fracture in a parent, that's also predictive. Uh, Being underweight, that is less than about 127 pounds. If you're thin, slight build, that's a risk factor. And if you're a current smoker, have any amount of smoking, that's also a risk factor. Low calcium or vitamin D intake, drinking more than two alcoholic drinks per day, taking, as I mentioned before, glucocorticoids, prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisone, oral or intramuscular for more than three months is a risk factor. And one of the biggest risk factors for fractures is obviously a fall. A fall is the biggest risk factor. That's how people typically break a bone is by falling. And that can be increased by impaired vision, dementia, poor health, frailty, low physical activity, or even history of recent falls are all uh, predictive. What the North North American Menopause Society did not mention, however, however uh, but I did review this study uh, just briefly in this podcast, is that those acid-blocking medications, proton pump inhibitors, uh, protonics, Prilosec, uh, H2 blockers, Zantac, also seem to increase the risk uh, for hip fractures, as does your own production, our own production of cortisol when we're living a very, I think, high-stress life. What I'd like to talk about now is what I call the clinical encounter. That is, when you go to a healthcare provider, what, what is it that you might experience with respect to bone health? 
If you are 65 years or older or postmenopausal women, woman, you may be recommended, you probably will be recommended a baseline bone density scan. I think that's a good idea. Get that scan done, see what your bone health is like. And in fact, I actually would recommend it more in the 50s just to get a good baseline uh, prior to the 60s. And if that is in the osteoporosis or osteopenia range, the doctor may decide to do some additional testing, uh, will likely recommend a medication, would likely recommend calcium and vitamin D, may recommend that you start exercising, however, likely will not give you specific recommendations. And so let's talk about some of those. Let's talk about additional testing that might be recommended depending on the doctor or the healthcare provider and depending on the patient who comes in and the medical history of, of that patient. Well, if it's a man and 20% of men can get osteoporosis, or 20%, I, let me say this, 20% of people with osteoporosis are males. So it is, while predominantly a female or a disorder that affects women, men also can experience osteoporosis. While most healthcare providers do not recognize this connection, it is now recommended, and I do recommend it, that if a man gets diagnosed with osteoporosis, that they also be tested or worked up for celiac disease. Any inflammations in the inflammation that occurs in the bowels can uh, result in osteoporosis, chronic inflammation. So that's a recommendation that I think uh, should be heeded, and, and if your doctor does not recommend that to you, you may want to bring that up within the context of the discussion to see if they'll order some of those tests for you. If a diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia is uh, concluded, is, is discovered upon a bone density scan, additional tests that might be recommended include a parathyroid hormone test, or what's called PTH, and it, it helps regulate calcium homeostasis in the blood. Calcium is very tightly controlled in the blood because it's involved in nerve impulses. And so there's a very narrow range in which the body tries to control the calcium. If you don't have enough calcium in your blood at any given time, the BTH goes up. What it does is it pulls calcium from the bones. It can also increase the calcium absorption from the intestines to try and help uh, balance that calcium out. It can also decrease the um, calcium that's being lost through the kidneys. Again, everything focused at trying to preserve and maintain a healthy level of calcium in the blood. However, if your PTH is elevated, it may be a secondary cause. A secondary cause is something that is caused not primarily by the organ itself dysfunctioning, by the gland dysfunctioning, but something else going on in the body. A very common secondary cause of elevated parathyroid hormone is vitamin D deficiency. And it is common to test vitamin D in people, so that could be indicated. But I still, as recently as just a couple years ago, heard reports from people where they had a secondary, uh, they had an elevated parathyroid hormone and the doctor wanted to go in and do all sorts of invasive additional testing and they never even tested the vitamin D level and it turns out the vitamin D level was quite low as soon as you supplement with the vitamin D in a normally function, functioning uh, gland that that parathyroid hormone can actually uh, come down. So that's something to be aware of. There are blood markers for bone turnover uh, and for bone health, some of them are called entilopeptide uh, and undercarboxylated osteocalcin. Those are a couple of the most common ones that may be tested for. But the question is always how predictive are those test results for fracture risk? They've both been associated with increased fracture. But, and, and here's an important point, when you're hearing on the news or looking at research that's maybe in the literature or uh, in the newspaper, the question is, and it's a very subtle distinction, but a very crucial one, an association does not necessarily mean causation. Let me give you an example. You can take two independent variables that really don't have anything to do with each other and make a link. They can say that the number of satellite dishes on people's homes has increased over the last 50 years, and so has the number of cars on the road. Therefore, the satellite dish 
is associated with the increased risk in cars, and you can say, well, that's the satellite dish, however, there's no way it didn't cause the increase in cars or vice versa. Similarly, when you look at, for example, a marker like undercarboxylated osteocalcin that has been associated with increased increase risk for osteoporosis and for fractures, but there are no clinical trials, prospective clinical trials, actually isolating that as the, the one variable that's being looked at, providing an intervention like a medication or lifestyle changes, and then tracking that over time to see if that actually is the cause of fractures. And in fact, there was one animal study that was done where they had mice that were deficient in osteocalcin, and those that had normal osteocalcin, and, and the ones that were actually deficient in it or didn't have it had stronger bones. So you've got to look at, and the question is, is there a clinical trial that shows that it actually is associated or causes fractures or reduces the risk for fractures? And when you get to uh, interventions or treatment options, which is going to be the subject of the next podcast, there are all sorts of different options that need to be considered, and you've got to weigh the benefits versus the potential risks of each of those to fully understand how you can create a, your own customized program to decrease your fracture risk as much as possible and to build stronger bones. This is Dr. John Neustadt for the MBI Health Report. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Podcasts are going to be weekly, about 30 minutes each. Download your podcast each week. Sign up to get those uh, announcements on our newsletter at nbihealth.com. We'll be announcing the podcast from there. Tell your friends about it. If you have questions, comments, or feedback, please email info at mbihealth.com. Thank you very much, and have a healthy day.